Okay, welcome folks. Uh, this is the House Corrections and Institutions Committee, and today we're, we're working this afternoon on corrections. Um, and one of the things we're working on, and the only thing we're working on, is the report that Downs, Rackland, and Martin did on the sexual misconduct at the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility. Um, just a little background, last year, <clears throat> well, more than a year, it was December, of 2019, there was an article in seven days that went through about 10 years worth of situations um, of uh, misconduct, sexual misconduct within the facility itself between uh, correctional officers and inmates, as well as out in the field with correctional field service officers and, in, and offenders who were on different community uh, statuses. It is a very, very complicated issue. Uh, where de It deals with correctional staff, but it also deals with union issues with the Vermont State employees, as well as our human resources department on the state level. So, um, and also our court system, if there's a criminal um, case, it then goes into our court system and it's not handled internally if there is a criminal case that has been charged. So there's many, many layers to this and we have, we spent a lot of time last year with, with DOC uh, in our committee going through some of the Prison Rape Elimination Act requirements, um, some of the situation, you know, situations that deal with human resources and trying to understand all the processes. And DOC, the administration contracted out with Downs, Rackland, Martin to um, do an investigation of sorts and come back with a report and also uh, report back with any initiatives that might be uh, put in place. So this is a result, the report was, was submitted on December 23rd of 2020. This is a result of extensive work that Downs, Rackland, Martin did. Um, and this is our committee's first look at this. And I am sure that folks who are streaming will wanna connect with us for further testimony. And we will be spending some time um, with some further testimony down the road. So with that being said, we have um, Secretary Smith here from the Agency of Human Services, along with the Interim Commissioner of Corrections, and along with two folks from Downs, Rackland, Martin that will also be walking us through this report. But I'd like to start off by starting off with Secretary Smith. Um, and um, welcome. And if any, when, whenever the first person, whenever you speak for the first time, Make sure you just introduce yourself for the record. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is uh, Mike Smith. I'm the Secretary of the Agency of Human Services. And as you may recall, um, more than a year ago, I requested an outside review of the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility. I felt at the time we needed an objective review of what was going on in our facility and an outside expert recommendations on the steps we should take uh, to address these issues around the treatment of our female inmates and staff. And as a result, I um, selected uh, Downs, Rackland and Martin and Tris and his uh, uh, and Jen and others to work on this report. Um, primarily because of their investigative backgrounds and uh, their thoroughness to these types of investigations. And um, I'm happy to report that, th that they did do just that in, in their report. This report contains some uh, disturbing details about the treatment of individuals in the state's custody and our response to their claims of mistreatment, mistreatment and harassment and abuse. And I just wanted to, the reason why I wanted uh, Trish to look at this and his team is um, because it gives us a roadmap. We will continue looking at the details of the report, but I have no question that this calls for further action and commitment 
from uh, Commissioner Baker and his team, which they I you'll hear from Commissioner Baker. They are committed to action um, and to face up the facts that we may need to make some hard changes to policy, to process, and more importantly, to culture to ensure that we treat every individual in our care as a human being. And while the report really lays out multiple areas for work within DOC, I wanna take a moment because I think this is important and I think Tris will reinforce this, but I think this is important to take a moment uh, to highlight the good work of many of our staff, uh, especially the leadership at the facility who committed um, committed to not only opening sort of the books and, and their facility to be examined, but also um, really a commitment to the core values of corrections and the humane and consider, uh, considerate treatment of the population of Vermonters in our custody. Most of our staff are hardworking. And I think, especially during COVID, you've seen this. We have some of the safest correctional facilities in the country uh, because of hardworking, dedicated professionals who put in long hours in very challenging circumstances. And their good work should not be lost in all of this. Um, it hasn't been lost on me um, throughout the, this crisis. And it, at, even as we seek to improve our culture, I think it's important uh, and strengthen our policies. I think it's important that we recognize some of the good work, much of the good work that our employees do. It's also important to recognize, in my view at least, that, our, that even our staff have been victims of misconduct. And whether it involves supervisors or co-worker, co-workers or otherwise, um, the type of behavior described in this report is simply unacceptable. The report calls for re-emphasizing re our zero tolerance standards for sexual abuse, sexual harassment, and sexual uh, misconduct throughout the department. I agree. Uh, we need to do that. Uh, the report makes core recommendations for DOC to address the issues of sexual misconduct at Chittenden Regional, calling on the department to re-emphasize and improve co core policies, increase oversight and monitoring within the facilities, including adoption of body cameras for our correctional officers and establish uh, training on the best practices for gender, gender responsiveness and sexual harassment. These changes will require work within the department and this agency and the external partners, including the legislature. I commit and Commissioner Baker, you'll hear later, will do the same to follow up on each of these recommendations as appropriate to correct the structural and cultural issues that have given rise to uh, these issues. Corrections can do better for Vermonters and corrections will do better for Vermonters. I also recognize that changing culture is not easy. It's not overnight, it's not quick, um, but we must recognize that failure is not an option here. Um, what this report describes is simply unacceptable. And as I have said before, we have strong professionals within corrections who are committed to this change at every level in the department. And we need the support of our union partners in the VSEA. We need the support of legislators to ensure that we make lasting and meaningful change and address all the root causes of the issues raised in this report. Um, this is a very challenging situation. And in fact, I'm hoping that we can implement every single recommendation in this report. Um, I don't think that's an impossible chore uh, to do. As I have stated since I beca became secretary here, um, and this happened about two or three weeks. The, the, the reports came out about two or three weeks after I had taken the job. We need to change the culture in corrections. And that's why I brought in Jim Baker. Um, that's what Jim Baker is doing and will continue to do uh, in his uh, tenure as uh, interim commissioner. I just want to say this in, in sort of closing. Um, I really appreciate the hard work that Trish and Jen and Tim 
who I don't see here, but uh, are, are, um, have done in putting this comprehensive report together. Um, it's their report. We were hands off on it. Um, it. It's their recommendations, it's their report, it's their findings, um, and I appreciate what they've done. We continue to make progress in addressing the treatment of women, both inmate and staff throughout corrections. And I think this is a good roadmap of where we need to go as we continue to do that, Madam Chair. So I will, um, I, Madam Chair, I'll leave it to you where you wanna go with this, but Tris has the meat of the report and then uh, Commissioner Baker can uh, follow up from there. I think that's the proper um, direction we should go. So why don't we go to, I hate to call you Tris. <laughs> <laughs> but Chris is just perfect. Uh, I answer to anything, though, uh, Madam Chair. And, and let me just say that uh, my partner, Jennifer McDonald, is here, uh, who also was integral in writing this report. And Tim Doherty is not able to be here today, uh, but he also was, was integral in that. And I just want to thank the committee for having us be here uh, today to talk about it. Jen is going to walk through the report thoroughly and kind of give perspectives uh, of, of the co-authors on this report, but I did want to just follow up very briefly uh, on what Secretary Smith said and a couple points. You know, one, overall, uh, we were impressed with the professionalism overall of the staff and leadership at the Department of Corrections. Not that there were, aren't areas for improvement, there clearly are, but the other thing that kind of goes with that and that, that openness or that, that need for some areas of improvement there was definitely an openness uh, to improving how they're serving Vermonters. As this committee knows, this is an incredibly complicated, difficult, and essential function for Vermonters. And it is really a, a difficult terrain. And uh, Jen, as she goes through this report, will describe some of that. And there clearly are some changes that, and improvements that need to happen but I at least left this report optimistic with the, uh, the leadership in the agency and in the department, uh, both, both on site and uh, overall, that they're open to looking hard and working hard and examining some hard truths here. So I, I promise I wouldn't say anything. I've said way too much. Let me please turn it over to uh, my partner, Jennifer McDonald. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, you're welcome. Jennifer McDonald, just introduce yourself for the record. And, then, and we do have copies of the report, so you can start walking us through the report. Thank or, you. or Jen, would you like to um, share your screen? I can give you co-host ability if you want to be the person navigating. Right now, I don't think I need that, but I will let you know. Um, I, I'm going to summarize the report, um, which I have in front of me, and, and uh, what I will do is we'll welcome questions afterwards because, as Secretary Smith said, this is a, it's a detailed report. Um, we are here now in 2021 discussing it because of a delay to some extent caused by COVID, but what that did do for us is it allowed us to take an even deeper dive uh, than the initial schedule called for. For that, we're very appreciative. And, and the result is, again, a detailed report that I think my summary is, is not gonna fully cover, but which I hope if there's questions and follow-ups um, that we'll be able to address that between uh, me and Tris. Um, again, I wanna thank- If I can just interrupt a little bit. If you're gonna be referring to a particular section in the report, if you can direct us what page or where to go, that would be very helpful. Absolutely. And please feel free to interrupt if you have questions um, on what I'm referring to so that you can follow along. Uh, I will give a, a high level summary that won't be tied to any specific page at first, but I will note uh, just at the outset that our recommendations officially start on page 48, um, but obviously there is discussion of that throughout. Um, I, I am delinquent in introducing myself for the record, so I'll, I'll do that right now. Part of our fault, too. <laughs> I apologize. That was part of our fault, too, the way we transitioned in. My name is Jennifer McDonald. I am a partner at Downs, Racklin, and Martin. Uh, in addition to Tris Coffin, as he noted, this report uh, and the investigation is the work product 
of uh, Tris, myself, and, and our partner, Tim Doherty, uh, who was unable to be here. I want to thank, uh, to start out with, again, the House Committee on Corrections and Institutions for having us today. This was eminently important work that we appreciate the state's trust in us to conduct this investigation. Um, and it, it has been a privilege to work on this throughout the past few months. And, and we are hopeful uh, that some of these, if not all changes and recommendations can be made because we believe in everything that we have put in here. Again, I wanna thank Secretary Smith, Commissioner Baker, the leadership of CRCF and DOC because uh, Again, although this was independent in all respects, it would not have been possible without uh, cooperation and access from uh, AHS and DOC. We reviewed an extensive amount of materials uh, and that review constantly required that we continue to review additional materials that came up. And throughout we received um, nothing short of full cooperation for all of our requests from everyone involved. There was uh, continuously a sense from leadership uh, and staff at many levels of how can we help make CRCF and DOC better. And, and that is the environment within which we conducted this investigation. We engaged uh, to assist us the Moss Group, which um, many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, in particular, we worked with Andy Moss, who has, uh, they are nationally recognized experts on corrections and the criminal justice system. Um, Andy Moss and her team are also familiar with DEOC um, and Vermont and have worked with the department in the past. Again, going back to what the scope of what we did, it, it's in our report, but I'll quickly summarize. We were asked to evaluate widely publicized reports of sexual assault, harassment, and misconduct at CRCF. Uh, when this came to light publicly last December, it was to many people in the community a complete shock. Um, and I do want to recognize, though, that this is something that um, everyone here took extremely seriously. And immediately after that was publicized, I, I, I don't recall exactly the time frame, but we were contacted to start this investigation to look into the extent and nature of those investigations. We looked at both whether this was a systemic issue and we looked at the accounts made by individual witnesses and the incidents, but we did not limit our investigation to just those incidents that were reported by the media last December. We extended that to incidents that may or may not have been reported. We were given access to all of the complaints at CRCF and we retained investigators to assist us in going out and meeting with witnesses. We took pains to ensure that anyone who wanted to speak with the investigation would have access to us. And we wanted to make sure that their feeling of safety in making those reports to us um, was a key component of that. And we have not disclosed the identity of any individuals who communicated with us in this report. Um, in part, we were also guided by uh, the policy of the Department of Human Resources to redact those specific names. But I, I do want to declare that there was full access to the investigation provided to anyone who wanted to communicate with us. Um, we investigated the systems, the incidents, and assessed how they reflected on the institution and the weaknesses and shortcomings and how things could be improved. And all along, we consulted with the Moss Group, um, relying on their experience throughout uh, the country and also with DOC. Uh, we have in the beginning of our port, uh, report, and I will just uh, turn your attention to um, first two pages that does give that highlight summary of uh, the scope and the recommendations that I've just laid out, uh, the role of the Moss Group and the investigators who assisted us throughout this investigation. Um, I'm going to jump to the findings because that's, that is really the meat of the report. The findings and, and Forgive me while I flip through this. I think the findings you'll see will start on page 23. You have a vestigo, investigo, 
findings on page 11, investigative findings, is that part of this too? Or not? Oh, my apologies. So I, I th that is that is the the section on investigatory findings. But I, I what I'm going to discuss right now. Uh, thank you for the clarification. Page twenty-three. Let's findings. move to actually page nineteen because that starts with the summary of some of the exemplary allegations that we encountered. Okay. I'm not going to go through these specifically. Um, uh, we, I want to point out that this is not all that we encountered in this investigation, although this is um, demonstrative of what we saw, and, and they include the range situations that included, uh, sexual situations, excuse me, of sexual misconduct that included categories of forcible misconduct and also misconduct that arose in the context of the power imbalance and deep uh, cultural boundaries that exist at the facility in which the resident believed that an act was consensual when as a matter of law, it is not capable of be, uh, being a consensual relationship. Um, that's a deeply problematic cultural issue that exists within the facility as you'll see in some of these uh, exemplary allegations. There was reports about residents believing that they had formed that relationship. Um, and, and I would say that while all of these reports are disturbing, uh, that was a theme that ran throughout of the inappropriate boundary issues that continue to exist at the facility. I wanna, there were three main categories of misconduct, uh, but we did focus primarily on what we have called in this report as staff on staff and staff on resident. Uh, that's not to say that resident on resident misconduct does not exist at CRF. That just was not our focus. Um, so I, I, I can't really speak to the extent that that may or may not exist. But as you'll see, this report is divided into those two prior categories. So those two categories, again, are staff on residents and staff on staff. Staff on staff. Okay. Correct. What about resident and resident? And they are, um, we have, th that is in different uh, sections of the report. So starting on page 19 would be the staff on staff, or staff on resident, excuse me, conduct. Great, thank you. In terms of the degree, um, I, I think, and we make this note in the report, I forget what page it is, but any instance of this kind of misconduct would be extremely troubling. Um, we did find it was borne out as reported in the media that this has occurred to a significant degree over the past few years. Uh, at this time, you know, I do want to point out that much of what we saw and, and investigated, many of these instances were reported in a situation where they were not reported and they were discovered by the investigation, we have referred these matters to the appropriate civil and criminal authorities. And, and if there's further questions on that, um, Tris can address that later on. But again, to the extent uh, these instances were not already known to DOC, they are now, um, and we have referred them as appropriate. Um, this misconduct, again, and, and I've talked about this, has arisen in a context of a power imbalance that exists um, just by the very nature of the system of corrections. And, and that gets to the recommendation for increased training, gender respons responsivity in particular, um, that is woefully inadequate in the system as we found it. Uh, in addition to inadequate gender responsivity training, we have found that the sexual harassment training given to staff is inadequate and that it is not mandatory. That was, I'll be candid, a surprise from the, in the investigation that when uh, given the nature of corrections, which is a very hierarchical structure in staffing, um, akin to a paramilitary organization that sexual harassment training is not mandatory. It is offered 
Uh, it is made available if people are interested, but again, it is not mandatory. And that is one of our recommendations that we that we request that uh, or recommend, excuse me, that that be something that all staff are required to participate in in an annual basis. One of the issues that we found is that DOC personnel uh, lack certain tools to substantiate or disprove allegations that allegations of sexual misconduct or um, in a widely reported instance, uh, drug use are reported. Um, but because the allegation is not substantiated, as opposed to just simply being proved to be unfounded, there's a belief of inaction within the facility and then that gets to issues that are of confidentiality and there are important reasons for that. But when an incident is determined to be unsubstantiated because the tools do not exist to prove or disprove that, there is a sense of anxiety both within the staff and resident populations where they believe action is not being taken. Uh, I, I do wanna highlight which Tris and Secretary Smith both discussed that over the past two years, there have been significant improvements that have been made within the institution. Progress is being made in the right direction under this new leadership. There is significant commitment to this. We have discussed in the report, uh, the work and the learning community being done between uh, CRCF, DOC, uh, UVM, um, and uh, interests in the model that is currently being used at the Southern Maine Correctional Institute. Uh, to, to summarize, and again, we can go through these in more detail if people have specific questions about the findings, we did find significant issues related to the cultural morale, uneven discipline, uh, procedural impediments, uh, issues with settlements, and, and I understand this is a, a very complex issue, issue with uh, employment settlements that result in um, discipline that may not be reflective of the uh, incident, which creates a, a strong sense among staff that action is not being taken and they do not fear that it is, or they do not feel that it is worthwhile to report and um, we found that there is increasing improvements in technology, but there is still a long way to go. And the technology provides um, a vehicle for assisting people in having a confidence in the system and a confidence that if they report these incidents, they can be proven and that action can then be taken to correct them. Um, so again, we have a number of recommendations in the report, which, start specifically at page 48. And I'll walk you through some of what we find to be really, really important recommendations here. Um, Re-emphasizing the zero tolerance policy as Secretary Smith talked for sexual misconduct of any kind and then standing by it. Uh, it's not enough to have the policies in place because as our investigation found the policies are there. And again, that's what the PREA audit looks at. But, um, uh, Finding that the policies exist and that the PREA audits find compliance with the PREA requirements does not necessarily mean that there is a feeling of sexual safety within the facility. So we must instill that confidence. Um, and at this point, again, our finding is that that confidence right now has been breached and that there is a sense of distrust that if something happens, if it is reported, the actions will not be taken. We encourage strengthening the rules and reporting guidelines, training for staff and supervisee conduct. As I mentioned, making gender responsive training at CRCF mandatory and part of the core competency trainings that happen annually at the facility. Again, they are offered currently, but they're not mandatory. One of our recommendations is to bring back the role of the Director of Women's Services. Many of the people that we spoke with, um, actually I will go out and I will say it was universally discussed favorably was this Director of Women's Services position that existed, I believe, when the women's prison was still located um, in the Dale facility. Uh, this will help ensure that the proper training is being provided that is unique training to um, serving the female population. Um, improving the incident reporting and decision-making process. We emphasize in our report 
uh, speed, transparency, communication with the people making the reports so that they believe that action is being taken. We do recommend seeking a legal change, permitting random drug testing uh, at DOC of the correctional officers or implement some form of non-random drug testing as permitted by the law. This is to give the tools to identify some of the issues that we found, or excuse me, some of the issues that were reported um, and were unable to be proven or disproven, which led to a significant amount of anxiety, um, feeling that the reports were being undocumented and were a security risk to the, to the facility. So um, I'm wondering if this is a good spot just to, sure. to catch our breath <clears throat> before we get into <clears throat> what may be required or recommended legislative changes. Maybe just looking at what DOC can do or needs to do internally. And it appears as if it really has to look at mandating training, which is one thing, but how do you ensure if you're gonna mandate training of all the staff that it really has a positive, it really has an impact? Because you can go through a program of, you know, an hour long briefing of training. And how do you know that that will change someone's perspective or help change the culture? Right now, what we know is that the training, other than what is provided at the uh, Vermont Correctional Academy, um, is only optional. So we know that it's not being provided to the extent that it should be. Since it hasn't been provided to that extent, um, we don't know, you know, to some extent there is this question of, you know, how, what impact would that have? But culturally, it creates a sense that these are significant and important issues and that there are unique issues um, that are different than those issues faced by the male population, that there are unique issues with in corrections with respect to a female population. And there are many resources that are already available throughout the country. Um, and this is where, again, the, the women's director, uh, director of women's services position comes in, that these are not trainings that we have to create from scratch. They exist, the resources that are out there. Um, I, you know, I believe the Moss Group has actually um, provided some of these trainings in the past, but it creates a culture where these types of gender responsivity are as important as other issues that are mandated for training. Okay, so I'm gonna open it up to the committee to see if anyone has questions at this point. Uh, Sarah? Hi, thank you so much. Um, Jennifer, I'm just wondering, you a lot of the what you've been describing and a lot in the report is, is very focused on the facilities. Um, we know that corrections also oversees um, and supervises uh, folks in the field. Did, would, can you describe a little bit about whether you looked at um, the RP, what we call PNP uh, offices and what uh, field, if you looked into field supervision as well? Uh, thank you. That's an excellent question. We did, and, and one of our recommendations relates to the contact that we found was being made between DOC staff um, and, and women who were under supervision who were not within corrections. That contact was via text. It was via Facebook. There are now resources that allow staff to identify, the to contact these women who are on supervision more readily than ever before through the Facebook uh, Messenger um, app. So one of our recommendations, because if you look at what conduct is criminalized, it extends only to people who are assigned specifically to that supervision. Um, and again, that we saw that, and that is very clearly from our perspective, far too narrow, because as we know, as you know, unfortunately, people may be in and out of the facility, but they are still on our supervision, whether they're specifically assigned or not. So that could be a situation, <clears throat> Jen, where uh, a person, a woman's been incarcerated 
and being supervised by staff within the correctional facility. And then is either uh, served uh, either out on furlough or could be out on parole or some form of community supervision and is now uh, being supervised by the field service op office. But, and that's, that's the direct link is that field service officer is the direct person supervising the offender. But she came from a correctional facility and if there was a correctional officer that was now harassing her or providing some form of sexual misconduct, there's no legal ramifications for that within the correctional system because that correctional officer is no longer responsible to supervise her. Is that correct? That's what the statute says right now. Criminal. I want to be I want to be specific that's a, it has to do with criminalization now is that inappropriate from a staffing perspective I think that's a that's a certainly a different issue um, how can you clarify that that I know it's a staffing issue but it's still so the statute criminalizes that behavior Right. So that creates a criminal issue versus there being a potential civil or employment issue. Um, again, our recommendation, I want to be clear, extends to this. Sh it should be criminal. Not civil. It should be modified. But in terms of what currently exists, it specifically says is supervised uh, if the supervisee is assigned to the caseload of that person who is out on supervision. Then it's criminal behavior. Right. And that's so that everyone um, can follow along. I apologize. I'm not that that can be found at page. We've repeated the statute at page 17 and 18 of the report. So if it is a correctional officer <clears throat> that had direct the head supervision of the inmate when she was an inmate and is now out on community supervision, if that correctional officer is still harassing her, there's not the direct supervision, that could be a civil case. Is that correct or is that internal to DOC? That would be an internal issue with DOC. And, and that I don't know the nature of that. I'm speaking specifically to the statute. It certainly should be inappropriate. Or so that's where you're saying issue. we need to coordinate. We need to look at both. I'm just trying to get what's in place now for clarification for everyone in the committee. So when and if there's legislation introduced to correct it, we know what we're talking about. So that's why I asked the question for it to be really specific. So my understanding now, <clears throat> if it's that correctional officers is, is harassing or abusing uh, a former inmate that was under their supervision. Right now that is dealt with internally within the Department of Corrections and also within Human Resources Department of our administration, correct? If it's reported, correct. If it's reported, if it's substantiated. If it's substantial, it, it, it has to, so you're right. So that gets to the reporting structure, which it, it is a complicated structure. Um, and we've laid it out in our report. Uh, it starts with a, DO, uh, a facility level investigation and there before it goes to DHR. Okay. So Scott, you have your question. Your yes, answer. thank you, Madam Chair. Um, What's been talked about is if a corrections officer, a correctional officer has, uh, is harassing um, or abusing uh, someone under supervision, then that would be a violation. But um, I, I guess I was under the impression that any contact, any sexual relationship between a CO and, uh, and someone under supervision would be inappropriate. Isn't it? Am I not understanding that? So I, I, I think I understand your question and, and I apologize if, if, please feel free to follow up. Any sexual conduct 
is inappropriate, but it cannot, there is no scenario in which it's consensual under the law. So it is always misconduct. Uh, okay, so it's, 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 always, it's always defined as abuse, regardless of whether, it's, whether the parties involved consider it consensual. And, and you raise such an excellent point, though, because of within the facility, there were situations where we spoke with witnesses who believed that they were in a relationship. They believed that they had, and, and there was a situation where, uh, and this person is no longer employed by the department, um, where we heard that they subsequently, after uh, the the women in, was no longer in the facility became engaged. That is a significant um, cultural problem within the facility that there is that there is that type of um, and I hesitate to call it a relationship, um, but for lack of a better term, relationship that occurs when it cannot be consensual in the first place. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I guess I could also imagine we're in a very small state where um, someone who is a CEO winds up um, who had a relationship or maybe even has a relationship with uh, somebody who's an offender then is in a position of, of, um, of supervising that offender somehow or yes, anyway, it can get very complicated very fast. I'm it sure. is and they're required to report that. The CEO is required to make that report. Um, we did find a situation where um, the resident, or uh, the, the, when the woman came back within the system, she was reluctant to make that report for fear of retaliation. The CO did not report it, but that is currently a requirement. Okay, thank you. So I'll get to you in a minute, Michael. I just want clarification on who was interpreting there was a relationship. Was it the correctional officer interpreting that or was while they were incarcerated? Was it the correctional officer that was interpreting that or was it the inmate that was interpreting that? In the specific situation that I'm that I am referring to, um, we did not interview the correctional officer. It was the resident. That had the feeling that she was involved in a relationship with a person that was supervising her. Correct, and and there is, these stories, uh, these accounts are not existing in a vacuum. Other residents hear about what happens and then they talk about that and that's another problem. So we also heard these accounts from, and the specific one I'm talking about, I wanna be clear, came directly from a resident. But there are other situations where other residents referred to, quote, relationships that were going on throughout the facility, which, again, are not consensual relationships. And it is, it is a significant problem and very disturbing to hear that this was happening at any degree. Thank you. So we have a couple more questions. We have Michael and then Karen. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, sure. Not sure if it's to you or to, to Jen, if, if we proceed which I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, spent a ton of time in the military. We had trainings on this kind of, you know, inappropriate this and inappropriate that relationships, et cetera, all the time. And if this was done, do we have agencies within the state that would conduct that training or would that be recommended to be an outside agency that would conduct that? How would that, what would that look like? Just curious. Thank you. S so I'll, I'll start and then defer to others who will have more information about this than I do. Um, I know from speaking with the Moss Group that they've provided some of this training, but I expect that there are other resources that uh, the commissioner or the secretary may be able to speak more to. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a couple more. So Karen and then Kurt. Yes, thank you. Um, I appreciate all this information and I especially appreciate the director of women's services recommendation. Can you speak um, up Karen? We're having a hard time yeah. hearing. Can you, can you hear me? That's better. Okay, great. Um, so thank you. Um, I was saying that I uh, appreciate the, um, the prioritizing of the director of women's services recommendation. Um, I feel like that is a key piece to all of this of having 
a point person, not that that person's going to, you know, save everything, but where things can funnel through and have that bird's eye view of everything that's happening, information come. I um, will say that I worked at the women's correctional facility for about five years when the women's director of women's was in place. And that was key to be able to go have that point person, go to ask questions, funnel mm -hmm. requests. Um, I see in the report that it isn't clear why that position ended. I know I've been curious why that position ended. I feel like that would be important to know in reinstating the position of why did it end so that we can make sure that whatever that is that caused it doesn't come up again to remove the position. So I would be curious um, if there is more info in there that didn't make it into the report. That's a great question. I think it's, it's, a, it's a question about the uh, history of what happens when there are changing administrations and um, new supervisors coming in and out. No one we spoke with knew specifically why that was. So that leads, I'll get you in a minute, Kurt. That leads to where we as a committee really need to focus. When you have a change at the top, regardless where it is, it can be a governor, it can be a secretary, it can be a commissioner. In DOC's world, it could be a superintendent of the facility, it could be a case supervisor of the facility. A change can occur if it's not within their, uh, not within statute, not within some legal contract, contract or construct, not within their rules and not within their directives. Um, and that's gonna be part of our role this coming session and next session to really look at these proposed changes to make sure that they are in place in such a way that regardless who is coming in or leaving, that they continue. I think that's gonna be imperative. And I'm not just saying that for DOC, I'm saying that for across the board for that. So Kurt. Uh, this question of boundaries is um, fascinating to me. And I see it as really difficult because we're trying to hire people who care about who they're working with. Um, we're trying to kind of, for that lack of a better word, demilitarize the DOC and turn it into a situation where we have people who genuinely care about the people they're taking care of and trying to rehabilitate them. And at the same time, we're telling them that they have to stand back from that as well. They have to create a boundary that's appropriate so that kind of, and, and this works for men as well as women, um, that kind of training is not something you can get by, um, as the chair said, by, or, or as um, other people have said, by uh, an hour of training or something like this. I'm curious as to how much training you see as appropriate. I mean, we hear about places where um, it takes two years to become a corrections officer and other places where uh, a week before you go into or work in a, a women's facility, you get a week of intensive training about how to work with women. But so can you give me some idea of, of the extent to which you think this kind of training needs to be? So I, I'm going to have to defer again to experts like the Moss Group who create these training programs. Um, I can certainly uh, make a finding that it's insufficient based on what we've learned to date. And I think that's very clear from the, the amount or the lack thereof that we're seeing right now and that any amount would be an improvement. What that training would look like, I think is a, is a that's a question for people who do this on um, a daily basis. Can I just jump in really very quickly and add just a quick comment. You know, throughout this, many of the uh, uh, issues that we found could be improved for 
uh, through, through, for lack of a better word, better professionalism in the culture. Mm -hmm. And so I think what you're talking about is a little bit of a long-term project to gradually change the course that the department has been on and improve the overall training, and not just, you know, you know, an annual uh, one hour training doesn't obviously do that. You're looking at going back into the Corrections Academy and really taking a critical eye to what we can do, particularly with gender responsive corrections practices, and also provide training for the, the, the people that are there. And that goes kind of across the board on so many different things that we dealt with here. But one really important thing that Representative Taylor brought up was this boundaries issue. And yes, you do wanna have incredibly empathetic correction staff who understand what modern corrections practice is, who understand sort of the modern approach to corrections reentry and community-based corrections where ultimately we realize that people are gonna be coming out of the facility and going out in the community and maybe doing that back and forth a few times, you know, realistically, but kind of are, are, are really attuned to that. And so that the boundary issues there are part and parcel of this professionalism. And I do think it's very important for the Department of Corrections to look at how in the long term it develops a correction staff who is empathetic, but still has that appropriate boundaries. You know, as an attorney, I feel that I'm very empathetic with my clients, but I have definite boundary issues. And that goes to, to uh, with, with uh, police officers, public officials, uh, employers, employees, supervisors. We all have these boundary issues, healthcare professionals. Um, I think we need to kind of in that spirit, look at those relationships and understand there are boundaries that need to be set, uh, but there also needs to be the empathy uh, in that relationship that Representative Taylor mentioned. Thanks, sorry for interrupting. Does that help, Kurt? Yes, yes. Okay, so we got a couple more folks. I've got Michael and Linda Joy. Um, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And I think um, part of it, in my opinion, and again, I'm sorry when I say relying on my military experience, but that's my big wheelhouse I operate from. We've done I've been through lots of, um, what shall I call it, not strife, but conflict and things that have, where you've had things go wrong and you've had to, to make shifts and, you know, I call it a paradigm shift or a cultural shift uh, is also a piece of what Kurt, I think, is getting at is you've got to, that's one component, but the other component of it is, is sometimes you got to look from the top down and I, and I read up on Commissioner Baker, and sounds like he has been a consummate problem-solving guy his whole career and was brought in specifically by uh, Governor Scott. Well, not just for this, but this was a big focus point. And it sounds like they got the right guy to be that, to lead that cultural, that paradigm shift and make that next step or the next leap or that next piece of progression. And I think you have to have that top-down driven um, uh, focus and you've got to have all of their subsequent leadership underneath him has to have 100% buy-in for this to be effective. So it has to be really looked at and, and watched very closely by him and his staff to ensure that uh, they implement and then they follow up on the implementation, if I'm making sense. That's just, again, how I see it from, from my foxhole. Uh, Linda Joy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I really would like to say, I'd like to commend, you know, Downs Rockland on the breadth of this particular report. It's thorough and the investigation was great. And I'd like to commend um, the entire administration for what they've done. But I have a question. Um, I'm trying to figure out and picking up on what Representative Morgan has just led into how do you actually create a legal compliance system when I'm not quite sure who's really accountable or in charge? Because I know we have 
Waterbury unit who does investigations. I know we have uh, what goes on in DOC, what goes on in the facilities. I know we have the unions coming in with grievances. I know we have attorneys that work for DOC that are still under the AG's office. So who is accountable? If you can tell me. <laughs> That's an excellent question. We, we can certainly address that. I think this might be a good, uh, first I'll let uh, either Commissioner Baker chime in or Secretary Smith. And if, if not, I can certainly try to address it from at least what we gleaned while we were doing our investigation. And I will highlight the question that you ask um, is a good one that we heard from many people, staff included. So do you want to speak up for this, Commissioner Baker? Yeah, Madam Chair, I, I, I do want to let um, Jen get through her presentation. But um, <clears throat> for the record, uh, this is Jim Baker. I'm the Interim Commissioner of Corrections. Um, and I think to, to answer Representative Sullivan, Sullivan's answer is I, I'm, I'm the one that's responsible for corrections. I, I'm, I'm, I'm accountable. I'm responsible. I'm the commissioner. At the end of the day, if you're gonna be in a leadership role, running a department is complicated and as um, diverse as corrections. Um, someone has to be held accountable and that's, in this case, it's me. Um, you have some very valid points representative about um, how challenging it is to deal with personnel issues. Um, you know, I've been dealing with public service personnel issues for 45 years and I wish I could make the process simpler, um, but there is a process. And part of the problem I believe in corrections has been over the years that we, we um, you may not like the process, but it's a process. And if you're going to treat employees fairly, but also hold them accountable, you have to follow a process. In many of the, the uh, for the lack of a better term, re repair jobs that, um, that uh, we just heard um, the representative reference my background. I, I, I've gotten into organizations where I see people don't want to follow processes. And that's where you start getting into trouble because the rules are different for everybody. And I find that, I have found that in corrections. Now, the investigative, internal investigative process to deal with human resource issues is, is extremely complicated. Can we do more work in that area? Absolutely. Um, and I, and I'll, I'll just leave it there because I do want Jen to have the opportunity to, to finish out what the recommendations are. And I'll be more than happy uh, to comment on the report and, and talk about what the plans are moving forward. We have in motion um, some very targeted plans um, to start dealing with this report and beyond this report, dealing with the overall culture. And I'll touch on that when I, when, uh, when it becomes my turn, Madam Chair, that's okay. Great, thank you, thank you. So let's continue with the recommendations. Um, so Jen, we'll turn it back to you so you can continue. We did really the first recommendation, I believe. And Patrick, let me flip back to... So I think this is a really good segue, uh, which Commissioner Baker was talking about who is held accountable, um, uh, but also the complex system that currently exists for um, investigation. There is a, it starts at the DOC facility level. Um, it is then referred up to DHR. We recommend that a liaison be put in place who can communicate between those two arms one of the things that we heard repeatedly was that there is not an, um, there is not sufficient transparency between the investigatory process at DHR and the leadership in the facility itself. So if that facility reports something, they do not always know what happens at the DHR level if there's a decision not to continue that investigation. And that is extremely problematic. So having someone who is in that liaison role who can create a uh, 
sense of transparency within the process that the commissioner was talking about, the process that's in place for very good reasons often and is complicated by the employment relationships at play and the contractual agreements at play, um, we think would create that sense of transparency that would give a confidence in the system that is currently um, significantly lacking. We also recommend a monitoring committee be put in place. Um, again, this, this is along the same theme that we've been talking about. That recommendation is on page, starting on page 50. The idea is, um, and we think that, you know, having many, many people um, who continue to report to us that they think that there has been a breakdown in the integrity of the investigation and disciplinary process. This monitoring committee would have stakeholders that could periodically monitor the reports about sexual misconduct that are being made and then the investigation and whether policies are followed, whether the discipline is fair, um, looking at these agency decisions um, it would be limited in size of very experienced people who could provide that confidence that currently doesn't exist within the system. Um, we have covered on page 51, the gender responsivity and uh, best correctional practices training, I think. So I'll keep moving on within the report. Um, Can I just ask a question on the monitoring committee? Is that something that who would set that up? Is that internal that it would done, be done with DOC or is it from the Agency of Human Services or is that done legislatively? So that's a great question. We recommend in the report that it be um, nominated by the governor, um, that process. And, and this was the great idea of Tris. So I will, I will hand this one over to him to, to flesh this one out for the committee, committee. But that that was the idea that it would be at that executive level to create a, an independence from the agency. So how, and maybe Tris, I intervened here, but how do you anticipate this being a continuum between governors? Do you need, is this something where you need legislation to establish this monitoring? You know, I, 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 I thought that uh, it was more important to set, uh, define the concept and then the details could be filled in. You could certainly see the legislature not agreeing with everything in here, and maybe the governor thought it wise to uh, uh, create this uh, committee or not. But, but, but you know, fundamentally, um, you know, I leave it to you to decide what kind of the best mechanism to do that. But the notion is that there, if there was some sort of a, uh, a committee that's independent and had some gravitas in the state, and as I thought of this, I thought of the... Uh, uh, frankly, a couple of the, 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 the current uh, and soon to be uh, retiring judges in our system who've got, you know, good credentials and experience uh, with the criminal justice system, with the correction system, with the recidivism, with the challenges of our community with opioid abuse and substance abuse, and maybe even specifically this facility who could sort of be, be you know, regulators on how this is is being implemented, and be a little bit of a of, a, of an honest broker in whether um, things are moving in the right direction, given the limits and challenges we have in our system in Vermont. So, so there the it is. Good is, luck. <laughs> so. Yeah, right. So the thinking is sort of a neutral outside entity looking in and being yeah. almost a go between between. The Department of Human Resources and Department of Corrections to make yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I guess I would say that my view of it was be, they would be more macro level, not sort of a court of appeals in individual cases, but they would say, you know, look at, you know, take input from the various stakeholders, including residents and uh, COs, the union, um, uh, uh, government administrators, uh, 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 non governmental agencies. And sort of every now and then kind of be monitoring this thing to see how it goes. So, for example, uh, it's not uncommon at all as a mechanism for uh, uh, settlements of, of legal actions between private parties or even public entities to have a paid monitor uh, to come and make sure that a complex agreement or a complex relationship is being um, 
uh, abided by in good faith. It felt to me that like, you know, appointing a professional monitor and appropriating money for it and those kind of things wasn't really a Vermont sized solution to that problem. And I sort of thought in my own head, I can think of several uh, people who could perhaps be willing to do this and do, do you know, really good service in this regard. The fallback mechanism though, is if we can't find or can't agree on, you know, a, a, a volunteer for this, for lack of a better term, then the uh, representatives of the different stakeholder uh, entities could be put together to form this group. I think it's important that it be small, uh, limiting it in its bureaucratic mechanisms because there's a lot of process in here already and you don't want to just add another layer of you know bureaucracy and complexity and processing here um, but I do think there's some but a role for a representative to give sort of a macro view at how these recommendations are being implemented and provide you know a, kind of an honest assessment of it as, as they're going forward. That's helpful thank you. Thank you. So let's continue with Jen. What I'm thinking is, and I don't know what people's schedules are, but maybe finish up with Jen and then take like a 10 minute break and then come back to interim commissioner Baker. Does that make sense to folks? I don't know what your schedule is commissioner. Are you available to do that or not? I'll make myself available, Madam Chair. I'm just thinking being on Zoom, we need sometimes a break just to get away and move a little bit. So let's see if we can do that. Um, so Jen, why don't you continue here? Sure. Thank you. So I, I think the, the next uh, we covered shortly before um, the first question series, we, we talked about the drug testing. Uh, you know, I, I wanna be clear, and this is in the report that we did not find widespread um, abuse or reporting of abuse of drugs within the facility. That said, the particular issue reported on concerning that in this report, um, certainly in the media has created a strong sense within the facility that if you make reports, they don't do anything about that. Uh, in this particular, uh, in this instance, there were reports that were made over the course of, I believe, three year time period. And uh, the nature of the reports meant that um, unless a substance was found on an individual, it could not be proven. So there was a sense of a strong sense that the rules were being flaunted, that there was um, insecurity within the facility. Um, so uh, again, this seems uh, this is an area where the facility uh, and the DOC does not have currently at its disposal strong tools to substantiate or disprove allegations um, that were being made to leadership over a multi-year time period. Uh, the next recommendation again has to do with technology, which we touched on briefly. Um, and this again has to do, it falls within uh, the category that I, I, I referred to here as tools to disprove or um, substantiate allegations. Um, we find that re when reports are made, uh, the facility leadership in the situations that we looked at did follow the process that was in place and met with people who were part of it. And if situations are denied, um, either by the resident in a, and I can think of one example in a situation where they believed that they were in the relationship that we previously talked about. And so they denied that there was anything that had ever occurred and there was nothing uh, that could prove or just that could substantiate uh, the allegation. Um, and so rumors perpetuated within the facility uh, and the staff rem member remained employed until um, he or she left. So having body cameras, 
which takes that guesswork out of the process and can substantiate any time or disprove because there are certainly those types of allegations, um, we think will go a long way in improving the confidence of both staff and residents. There has been significant improvement in the survey the facility surveillance over the past year. I think it's noted in the report there was something like uh, uh, on the number of 60 some cameras that were in place that has now gone to over 100. So those are great improvements. Um, there's reason to believe, strong reason to believe that there's still a lot of room for improvement and that they are motion censored um, cameras. And if there is no uh, detectable motion occurring, the cameras are not recording. Um, so the sensitivity of those cameras, again, our, our investigation did not go to the very micro level of looking at the specific technology and how much motion is required to trigger that camera. But we know that uh, there are situations where someone made a report and that uh, the video was pulled and that there was surveillance cameras in the vicinity that would have captured the incident, regardless of whether some misconduct was happening, but that the motion uh, sensor stopped triggering the footage for a period of time that meant that although there was a camera in the vicinity that could have substantiated or disproved to be, you know, and so that it would be unfounded, it no longer it doesn't exist, it never existed. Um, and that's an area that needs to be improved because more cameras doesn't do any good if they can't be triggered. Um, so that's an area for additional improvement. I, again, I, I can't reemphasize enough the importance of the body cameras. We know that's a, that's a significant change, um, something that hasn't as far as we're aware previously existed, but we are aware of other states that for the same reasons we're recommending it here have required that body cameras be worn um, on all COs. And I believe that is it for uh, the specific recommendations within the report. Again, uh, Tris and I are both happy to address any additional questions. Great, is there any questions before we take a break and then shift when we come back to interim commissioner uh, Baker. Sarah, did you indicate something? Did I see something? Yeah, it's just, it's fairly quick and I think it's better for the, um, for the DRM folks, if you don't mind, Madam Chair. Um, um, so I was, this report was really thorough and I really wanna say, I really appreciate it the way, not just the way the work was done, but the way you organized the material. One question that I had that I was kind of, disturbed in, to find in your findings was that the audits for the PREA audits that are done and required um, didn't, didn't um, surface any of this information. And I understand that that's one of the reasons why you're recommending the Independent Misconduct Commission, but would in a, why do you think that is, that the PREA audits didn't really surface some of, some of the, the, the things that when you're, because when you're talking about that there were weak policies, because I think what you're saying in this report that the, the PREA audits came back positive and clear at the same time that there's some pretty serious issues going on. So specifically the PREA audits look to determine compliance with the PREA regulations that are in place. And so to the extent that our policies did comply with those regulations, which in almost every situation they did where they didn't. Um, there was a corrective action that was taken to bring DOC into compliance. But um, simply complying with those regulations in a sense that the policies exist or that the process is being followed does not ensure that these situations um, A, aren't happening or B, uh, are happening and being reported. Okay, so what I'm hearing you say is that it's as much a procedural issue as a cultural issue within the facilities about a reporting, like that there's a fear of retribution if, if event and, and instances were not reported by staff or residents. 
There's a fear of retribution. There is also back to the cultural issue of a fear of reporting someone who um, a resident may believe that they have a different type of relationship with than is legally permissible. Thank you, that really answers my question. I appreciate that. Anything else before we take a 10 minute break? Madam Chair, I'll put up a break uh, sign on my screen and if everyone could mute their audio and turn off their video and we'll use you when you come back as the signal that we're starting back up. Uh oh, <laughs> 10 minutes, let's try, let's, uh, yeah, let's do close to 3.30 because as I see 3.17, so let's say 3.30. So I'd like to tie up around four o'clock a little bit after, maybe five minutes after four, if possible. Um, I have another meeting that's popped up that's not connected with this at all that I have to attend to. So um, that just came up. So I have to take care of that. Um, so I would, I'm going to put out that we are going to be looking at this report more intently and spending some time with it. I want to allow committee members time to really read it over and digest it. Um, and I don't know, I know some of these initiatives, maybe governor recommends in some of the budgets uh, coming forward. We don't know that at this point. So we need to let that play out um, over the next week or two. And that will give us a little bit better direction in terms of where our focus may be. So just to give the committee and you folks out there that are on YouTube uh, some direction in terms of where we are headed as a committee. So I'm gonna turn this over to Interim Commissioner Baker. And before we start, we do have a new committee makeup, Commissioner. And um, it might be good for the members who are new to this committee to introduce yourselves. We do have a new vice chair, uh, Representative Coffey. Um, Representative Shaw did go up to Transportation Committee. Um, so that's a big shift. And we have a member who is, comes from a different committee who's been appointed here and then three brand new members to the legislature. So if we could start with Scott and then go to Michelle, Karen, and Michael. Um, sure, Madam Chair. Well, we did, we did do this a couple, well, last week, I guess it was. Yeah. Quickly. We did with the commissioner? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, that's right. Last Friday. Yeah, yeah. Um, Madam Chair, I'm certainly glad one of your committee members told you that, not me. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that Friday seems so long ago. Yeah, I'm it's never good for the, the, the interim commissioner of corrections to offend the chair of the uh, House Corrections and Institutions. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> so again, to introduce myself, I'm Jim Baker. I'm the interim commissioner of corrections. And, I want, I want to thank um, Tris and uh, Jen, and Tim's not here today um, for the work that they did on the report. And uh, I'm really happy to hear that what they found inside corrections was nothing but cooperation from the leadership and the staff um, providing the information they needed. And um, even though the Moss group is not represented here today, I'm deeply appreciative to Andy Moss and her team at the Moss group um, that worked on the some of the focus groups that were conducted uh, inside um, the facility as part of this review. So I, I, wanna, I wanna publicly acknowledge that. And, and again, my staff who was um, very cooperative. You know, I guess for, for, for me, um, uh, you know, you heard me say this earlier to a, to a question from Representative Sullivan. Um, you know, the secretary and I, um, are taking this report very seriously. Um, you know, there's there's some troubling things in here, um, but it wasn't stuff that I hadn't heard about before, um, but with much more detail and with much more clarity because of the work that was done by by DR, DRM. Um, I, I want to just start out by saying that we do have a plan to address this, and uh, it's in its very early stages. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit. And then I, I will go to some of the questions that came up that 
that, that Jen may not been able to answer because they're really correction related questions. Um, and, and then I'll be more than happy to take questions. Um, the plan moving forward is, is that I, I have taken uh, Bill Soule. Uh, Bill is the district manager of the Hartford Probation and Parole Office and temporarily assigned him to report directly to me. And he is the point of contact to come up with a plan to implement the recommendations in this report. Um, you'll, you'll get a chance to meet him as you continue the conversations with us about the report. And um, the first steps that I've asked him to, to uh, focus on is creating a strategy on how we're gonna ta tackle these recommendations. That's gonna, uh, that conversation occurred last week and uh, he's got some things to clean up in his role right now as the district manager of the Hartford Probation and Parole Office. And uh, why Bill Soul? Bill Soul is a 40 year veteran of the Vermont Department of Corrections and has extensive experience in dealing with the female population. He led the team that moved um, the females to Windsor, uh, the female population uh, when they moved there. And um, he, uh, he's been through some of the training that Jen described, uh, the sensitivity training, the uh, responsive, responsibility training on gender. Um, he, in conversations with him, he really understands the complications around um, housing in a correctional facility, a female population. So I'm looking forward to Bill um, being the tip of the spear on this as we tackle the recommendations that are in the report. I wanna, I wanna just make a couple comments um, about a lot of conversation about culture change and staffing. And, uh, you know, for the folks that have been on the committee from last year, you've heard me talk about this before. And, uh, you know, I, I think it was in front of your committee that I made the statement about the sexual, sexualized workplace environment. And this kind of goes to the culture. Um, I, I don't, I don't accept um, that, um, and, and I'm certainly not challenging um, Representative Taylor on this, but I don't accept that it's that difficult to keep boundaries. A lot of professions have to keep boundaries. And uh, there's a big difference between boundaries and being a predator. There's a big difference. And uh, part of the changing of culture, and this came up with Representative Morgan, um, and and I'm, I know he's probably drawing on his experience at the Vermont National Guard and the challenges they had. And I would refer you to those kind of stories that we've heard about. The Catholic Church, the, 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 guard, the guard. These are places that Jen touched on that have power differentials between certain individuals that are in a hierarchy position over other individuals. And many, many organizations have struggled deal with the issues that, that surround um, the issue of sexualization in the workplace. But the place where it starts is number one, acknowledging it. And um, with you seeing the report today, uh, we released it at a press conference uh, just before the holidays. And I said this at the press conference and I'll say it again. Ask the question about who's responsible I am. As long as I'm here as the commissioner, I'm the person responsible to make these recommendations um, come to life. Um, but part of, part of changing an organization is acknowledging that you have a problem. And what I'm doing today, and I'll do it again today, as I've done before, we have a problem in the workplace with certain employees. Now, with that said, the secretary said this earlier, uh, one of the things that um, has really put me back in my chair for the year that I've been here is the level of dignity and respect and humanity that the majority of the individuals who work in corrections show to the people that we're responsible for. And um, just to demonstrate again, how complicated the situation is with, with the women and the population that we have at Chittenden. Um, you know, I'm sad to report, we've all saw it this week. Um, we lost two women this week. The overdose test is what we believe it is. And I don't want to go too far into this today. I know at some point, Madam Chair, I'm sure you're going to want to talk about those that situation. Only if these, only if this situation of what we do for work every day was so easy, 
and let me lighten the moment for a minute, we could easily find a permanent commissioner of corrections instead of an interim commissioner of corrections because this is complicated business. And changing culture in an organization is even more complicated. Uh, and, and again, I, I appreciate um, Representative Morgan. I, I want to call him Colonel Morgan, but I don't want him to start calling me Colonel Baker. So we'll stay away from that. But I, rep, I, I appreciate um, his comments earlier about the culture and how difficult it is to change culture. It takes a period of time. But you've got to acknowledge it and you've got to send a message and you've got to set a tone. And, the, and, and I've been very clear about this, that the sexualization of the workplace, the retaliation against employees and or folks in my custody are unacceptable. And we, we are going to work on this as we've been working on it for the last year. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled to hear that Jen reports that there is a difference at that facility in the last year and a half, two years. And I, and I got to, I'm going to, I'm going to again call out, just like I did last year, Commissioner Mike Touche, because mm -hmm. Mike started the organization on this path. And uh, I'm, I'm, I came in behind Mike, and I'm following that now. And we have a lot of work to do. I'm committed to doing the work, and I'm committed, committed to working with this committee and other folks to implement um, the changes that are recommended. Let me address a couple issues that came up that I don't think you know, Jen was not in the position to answer. And I think the, one of the first ones was with, with Representative Koff, you asked about if they took a look at the probation and parole offices. And I just want to kind of expand on that. I think what Jen was saying, and I, I don't want to speak for her, but um, what she was saying is she was looking at the relationships that get built um, between staff and um, individuals that may be in the facility and then released to the community. Um, I, I don't believe that it was a deep dive into the probation and parole offices. And I can, I can be corrected if I'm wrong on that. But just to be clear about their recommendation on the law change, certainly we should work with you on that. We support that. We support these recommendations. But there are work rules that deal with employees becoming involved in, with individuals that are on our caseload either incarcerated or in the community that does not allow them to become sexually involved or in a dating relationship or other inappropriate relationships with them. So those are dealt with as a human resource investigative approach with discipline. Um, we do support having the conversation about changing the statute on that point. Um, I, I think um, the question came up about the director of women's services and um, as I understand it, and I'm not here, I understand that was, uh, that was a victim of budget cuts in a given year. And, uh, you know, we, we certainly will, will circle back and start talking with this committee and other committees about how we can make that change. But for the time being, um, it, although I, I don't want him to get settled into just the Director of Women's Services, Bill Soule will have the point on the issues about what we need to change and continue to change, what's been changing at the facility in South Burlington. Um, let, me, let, me, let me make another point. There's a lot of recommendations in here about training and, and the sexual harassment training that Jen brought up. Um, it, is, it is troubling that that's not mandatory. But I, want, I, I mean, I have, I have to say this about policy and training. Um, and I think you all, you, you all understand this, but I think it just needs to be on the record. You can have the greatest policies and the greatest trainings in the world. If your culture is bad, cultural elite policy and training for lunch every single day of the week. Let me repeat that. Culture will eat policy and training for lunch every day of the week. That's my experience in, 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 uh, in coming into organizations that need to be changed. What we have here for certain individuals is a culture that needs to be changed. The rest of the stuff is important legs to the stool to change that, but we have to drive the point home for people to understand that this behavior is not acceptable, it won't be acceptable, and I'm not gonna tolerate it as long as I'm the commissioner. That's the tone that has to be set, and that's what we're setting for the tone. 
Um, we do have challenges around investigations of employees' conduct. And I, I don't want to get into it today, but I, I, do, I do want to talk to the committee about it. And I do want to touch on, I think it was Representative Coffey that asked the question about PREA. Um, and and, and, and it, was, it was a great question. Why could corrections pass PREA audits and still have this stuff going on? It's because the PREA audit is about checking off boxes. That's what it's about. It's not about being um, aggressive in taking PREA guidelines and making sure you're in compliance below the surface. Above the surface, PREA guidelines, check off the box, you're doing this stuff. Below that is, is the underbelly of that, which is what this report is about, is the underbelly of what happens. And I've, I've said this before and I, in, in private to some representatives, I think uh, Representative Emmons, we've talked about it, and. Representative Shaw, before um, he moved off the committee, we talked about it. This is why corrections needs an investigative unit. Now, I'm not talking about investigating. I'm talking about investigating incidents or being ahead of, proactively doing things such as looking at videotape and other proactive steps. And it goes beyond this. It's, 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 the, two de it's the death of the two women in Burlington. Not that we would do the death investigation, but we need an investigative unit to make sure that when major incidents occur, that we are in fact following pro protocol, an escape from jail, an attempted suicide, a suicide, a death of people in our custody. Not that we're gonna be doing death investigations, that's the job of the state police, or in this case, the job of Burlington PD, but I wish I had a couple investigators trained up that when I got the call the other day that they could have responded immediately to Burlington and start gathering the facts to make sure we're following policies and procedures and we're doing what we need to do to find out if there was a crack in our system that we could have done something better. It causes, the way it's done now causes a very chaotic situation. And when it comes to the issues around Perea, it causes, we're very reactive, we're not proactive. And if we're gonna get ahead of this, we need to be proactive, not reactive. So. These are a couple observations, Madam Chair, that I made as um, Jen was doing the presentation um, of the report. Um, if, if, if people want to get into specific recommendations, I'll, I'll give you my take on it. But I will say it's a little bit early. Um, we are, you know, we are reacting to it and we are moving forward and we're moving fairly quickly. Now, I, I just want to wrap up my comments by saying this. Superintendent Messier, the superintendent at the facility, um, has done an incredible job in building relationships with organizations um, that are providing um, great services um, to the women in South Burlington. And um, she's done an incredible job. And some people may say, well, why not just have her implement um, the recommendations? It's because the job of running that facility is so time consuming that it wouldn't be fair to ask her to focus on just these recommendations. It is in no way, shape, or form a silent message that I don't support the leadership of Superintendent Messier. I do, and she's doing an incredible job. And I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, we're, we're, we're layering other support around her so we can, in fact, move the ball further down the field. But this is going to take time. Culture, mm -hmm. change, culture change is going to take time. I think if uh, I, I do know in talking with Andy Moss. And we are going to continue engaging Moss Group in our in our work, but I in, in my conversations with with Andy Moss um, since she did the work with DRM, um, you know, her, the feedback has been consistently that there is a difference in the last two years at the facility from where it was two years ago, and that that doesn't mean we say okay, declare victory and move on. And I, and I promise this is the last thing. This is not the only place where we have cultural issues around these issues, right? It just happened to be that it was the most high profile as a result of the work that was done by seven days. So the, the focus here and the goal in my conversations with the leadership team is that we're gonna create a blueprint and formula on how to deal with this at Chittenden 
and then we're going to move it from facility to facility to, to address the issues that need to be addressed. This is a huge opportunity for us to step back, self-reflect, pay attention to what's going on, be engaged, be present, be awake, and take these lessons that we're learning here and then move them throughout the system. And so that's the ultimately um, the vision that I have as we move forward on the report. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for any questions, Madam Chair, to close me. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you. And I know we have a question from Scott, but I just really wanna emphasize <clears throat> that any changes that we put in place either legislatively or internally within DOC's um, realm of their policies, that it is not just for the women's facility, it is across the system. Because we may be focusing on the sexual misconduct, the harassment, the abuse um, with the women who are under our custody, but I am sure that similar behavior is happening with our male inmates and offenders as well. And I don't want to discount that, that this is a systems issue. And I want to thank you, Commissioner, for taking this on and laying down the foundation of how we move forward so that these initiatives are in place regardless of who is in power, in what position, and where in the system, because I think that's so important for that. So we do have a couple of questions. Scott, you had your hand up. And Karen, did you have your hand up? Was that the hand I saw? OK, Scott and then Karen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Commissioner, I, I, I want to commend you for emphasizing the culture in the institution as, as the what makes everything work, And um, because I, I couldn't agree more. And, it seems to me that culture starts at the top. Um, and that, that is a, the example set by the leadership is, is, is critically important. And, and not, just, not just in terms of policies and protocols, but in terms of the culture, which is a, a, an intangible thing many times. What, what I'm curious about, what I, what I would uh, like to, to, to hear from you, not today, but as time goes on is, any ideas that you might have about how how to institutionalize that cultural um, attitude um, that is uh, that will that will survive uh, a leader who is not um, up to up to snuff? We've we've had leaders like that in certain places in, in our country, and so how do we how do we build how do we build an institutionalized culture that? Uh, that respects the all of all of the uh, issues that we're talking about today, and I, again, that's not something I really expect you to have an answer for right now. But I would like to talk about that as time goes on. Yeah, yeah, not, you know, Representative, I don't I take up a lot of the committee time, but one of the things I will say to you is is that it is it does start at the top. But my experience is is that cultural change happens unit by unit. Um, you know, I, I can. And especially when you're in an interim role. And, and again, I have to say this, and I, I heard Jen say it and I heard Trish say it, the vast majority of the people that work in corrections are incredible human beings. I can tell you the last two days, uh, I've, I've been with them on an emotional roller coaster ride as a result of losing those two women. Um, they're, they're amazing human beings. They work very hard every day. But inside there, inside there, is a little bit of rot that we need to deal with. And so um, to institutionalize it, we have to invest in leaders and we have to invest in leaders that are willing to stand tall. And so we can talk more about that as the committee, as committee time goes around. Yes, sir, thank you. You're welcome, sir. Uh, Karen and then Michael. Yeah. Um, Commissioner, just really appreciate um, your acknowledging kind of the significance of this issue, the situation, your commitment to change and getting the work done, and then just your transparency and communication. Like this is just very appreciative of this that we're able to have this conversation, move these things forward. Um, I'm curious how 
this report or the recommendations have been um, communicated with staff and potentially the, the residents and how, how have they been received or just how has that been? I realize it's been a short turnaround, but I know word gets around quickly. Um, so curious to see, just thinking of the culture piece again, that's the initial response. You know, Representative, I, I've gotten very little pushback from anybody around me or from leadership in the field. Um, I, I do appreciate your comments about being transparent. My wife tends to tell me that I'm, I'm too transparent, that sometimes I'm, I, I say too much, but um, I, I, I'm getting very little pushback. And I'm, I'm pretty, you know, my, my relationship with the leadership in corrections, I think, you know, I've spent a year building trust with them. I think they trust me. And I think they trust where we're trying to go because everybody, I don't know of anybody in the system that doesn't want to make the system better. And this is even some of the folks that, you know, I, I hear from other correctional folks that have been around for a while. Well, I don't know about that person, but when I get into a conversation with them, at the end of the day, deep down inside, they know that our job is to protect the people that are in my custody and that we have an obligation to do that. And sometimes it's not an easy job. It's very difficult. And working in a facility is very, very difficult. Working out in the field is difficult. The population is, is complicated. So the report has been, um, it's circulated amongst the leadership team. Um, once we get Bill in place, we'll start the process of some focus group conversations with the leadership on the ground and really start talking about what's in the report and what that means. And uh, that'll include our relationship with the union as well. Thank you. Michael? Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, just it's kind of regurgitating a little bit of what's already been said. And, um, and I'm not trying to get into the Colonel's Mutual Admiration Society here with Commissioner <laughs> Baker in terms of, <laughs> but uh, to applaud him and his efforts. And uh, I know what he's going through, like he alluded to, been through a lot of this um, in different forums from the military. No, no agency is excluded from uh, having things go wrong and having, you know, the kind of the 1090 rule, the 10% that wreck it for the other 90%. In this case, I would even probably be so bold as to say it's probably more on the magnitude of 1% and ruins it for 99%, I think, a majority of the time. And, but I, but I applaud the efforts of the organization overall, um, taking it on head on. Uh, an old NCO of mine once said, he said, sir, he says, a bad idea never gets better with time. And so I, the agency has taken this head on. They're taking the, the bad idea and fixing the bad idea and, and uh, taking that bad al apple out of the barrel. And, um, and again, being transparent, like was spoken to. And, and again, I applaud the efforts and uh, um, I look forward to uh, seeing this agency improve itself. I think, like you said, Commissioner, I, I'm very convinced I, I, I know uh, corrections officers that work for you folks and they're good people, their hearts in the right place. They're, uh, principled people that would not do wrong. Um, and I, I like to think that that's 99% of our people and I'm sure it probably is, but, um, like any other organization we'll, we'll get better when the day is done. And thank you, sir, for your efforts. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. My, my saying is that um, bad news is not like fine wine. It doesn't get better with time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I, I know when this report was um, rolled out back in December, there was a little bit of conversation about how the role of our facility plays into this. Um, and I don't know, Jen or Commissioner, if either one of you want to weigh in on this. We didn't we haven't touched on this, but there was um, some shortcomings that were um, shown about the facility itself. Can anyone weigh in on let, that? I'll certainly let Jen talk about that in their report first, and then I'm willing to comment on it, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you. Um, it, it was. Uh, I will say shocking to go into the facility and meet the residents and hear the stories about what 
was just unsanitary conditions. I think you've all heard about the situations in the shower. It's been widely reported in the media. The facility itself is old, uh, dilapidated. That was reported widely and just not conducive to the um, efforts to uh, ensure that people were able to participate in the programs necessary to return um, people to the communities. So it, it's just so clear that this facility is outdated and is not able to meet the needs of a modern correctional facility. From meeting with um, Commissioner uh, Mer uh, Messier, speaking to Dr. Fox, we spoke to Dr. Fox as part of the investigation. Um, we understand that they are looking at the Southern Maine Correctional Facility as the model of a modern correctional facility, but again, we didn't go, we certainly didn't go to Maine um, and aren't, uh, didn't delve that deep into the comparisons between that, but from everyone we spoke with, including the Moss Group, um, it, it, it's clear that this is not a modern facility, changes need to be made, uh, the conditions, um, uh, hearing about the sewer flies in the showers was just appalling, um, so. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, Madam Chair, I don't, I don't, I don't think I probably can elaborate on that much more than than to say that from a policy standpoint, you and I have spoken about this. Um, you, you cannot convince the women that are in our custody that you care about them if you keep them in a facility like we have, but that's the facility we have. And uh, it is absolutely critically important, you know, and everyone knows that I speak for Governor Scott because I work for Governor Scott when I say that the administration supports moving forward on a, on a, on a new facility. Um, we've talked about this, talked about it last year. We've had some conversation about it this year. And I think the important piece to understand is what, what you heard Jen say is that, um, it is not built to be able to do the proper program and do it with a level of dignity and respect that every human being deserves. And so we can't continue to do and talk about, we wanna raise the bar on what we do for the women population and then talk about um, not acknowledge the fact that that facility is, is in bad shape. And look, this is not a reflection on BGS or anybody else. It's just wore out. And you can only stay so far ahead of it. And I think your committee heard from, from uh, Chief Cormier this morning about the feasibility study and the importance of, of having the conversation and start to move forward. And let me just finish it by saying this, because I, I, as I researched today in the report, and, and Madam Chair, I think you know this because you been here uh, long yeah. enough to remember, you know, we've moved the women four times, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. four times in what? You help me out, Madam Chair, eight uh, years? Four years? times and probably about 12, 15 years. Okay, so we've moved them four times. Um, and I'm not criticizing everybody, you know, look, they, they had to be moved for various reasons, including Irene in the flood, understand it. But if, if you're someone in the system and and uh, that's the way you see yourself being treated. There's nothing we can do about that from the standpoint of what I can do with my staff to send a better message. And I think it's important that we understand that a big piece of what's wrong here is this that facility needs to be replaced. We can have the argument, should we have a women's jail or not? I will say to you is that we need a women's jail, but we also need the thinking around how we're gonna transition women. And it's a little raw for us in corrections right now because um, it wasn't the finest moment this week trans transitioning women. And uh, it's a little raw for us right now inside corrections. So I, I, I have to emphasize the importance of this. And Madam Chair, I know where you are on it because we've had countless conversations on this. Thank you. Questions, thoughts? Okay, so that sort of lays the groundwork for us in terms of some of the issues we'll be working on on corrections. Um, 
and and also on our capital budget because we don't know what's going to be in the governor's proposed budget on any of the budgets, be it our budget or be it in the general fund budget. But we will be uh, revisiting this issue of this report and all its nuances in many ways over the next coming weeks. So anything else before we finish up here and transition away from live stream into back into our real lives? <laughs> Kurt, did you have something or are you just leaning back? Okay. Okay. Anything else? If not, again, for folks who are streaming, if I know, I don't know what our schedule is going to be um, in working on this. I don't know. I don't think we'll have much time next week, but possibly the following week. And then we'll need to balance the work here with this report with also our other big priority is putting in place our two year capital budget funding, um, which will be starting once the governor presents his two-year uh, budget. So with that, if anyone is interested in connecting with the committee to testify, please feel free to reach out to myself and Phil Petty, our committee assistants. And if you reach out to both of us, at least for me, please use my legislative email address. That would be the more appropriate way to communicate. So we will be back here tomorrow morning at 9.30. Uh, VSEA is coming in just to give us a little update on who they are and who they represent. Um, and then we'll go from there. <laughs>